So I'm working on this Datura 1082 multimeter which I picked up recently. There's nothing actually wrong with it, it's working fine. At least the stuff I've tested so far has been working fine. But what I want to do is recap it all before there's a problem. So all the power supply will need recapping, I know that. All these caps in the front here on the analog board, those will need replacing, they always do. Now what I'm actually going to do as well, because of my experience with the Datron calibrator, the 4700, I'm also looking at tantalum caps, because in that thing they're known for having lots of problems with tantalum caps blowing. But I believe that's because if the supply starts to fail, the caps start to go, then it puts a lot of ripple across the power supplies and then it blows the tantalums out because I don't like the high voltage. And I don't like that big noisy ripple supply, because there wasn't enough headroom. There's a couple of tantalums on here, there's actually three tantalums on this back board on the power supply. So we've got the big literalistic caps in there, and there's also some tantalums. And the 15 volt rails have got 25 volt tantalums on them. And there's also a 5 volt rail which has got a 6 volt tantalum on it, I believe, I've got to check that, but I think it's 6 volt according to the circuit diagrams. Which isn't enough headroom, so on the 15 volt rails, 25 volts is kind of pushing it really, so I'm going to double it, kind of. I'm going to go to 35 volt caps. So that's then more than twice the supply rail. I've got caps here, I've already got them, so I'm just going to swap those 25 volt tantalums out with some 35 volts, just in case, just to make sure that anything that comes in on the power supply side is less likely to be a problem, right? Further down the line, it's probably going to be alright. I'd be surprised if any problems with the boards, but the actual power supply is the most critical part. If you get that bit right, the rest will be okay. So, as is potentially those capacitors get hit quite hard because of the power supply noise, then I'm going to replace those ones. Like all the other multimeters I've done, all these other Datrons, like 1062s, and done what, four of them, I think, they've all been fine, haven't they? Any problems with tantalum caps. But then I've caught them quite early, I think, with the power supplies, the noise in them, they're only just starting to get a bit weak. So I think I actually caught them before they could have failed. So I think I've got away with it, those ones, but um, this one I'm going to replace them anyway, just going to do it. Interesting thing with this, this is how the battery replaced, it's got something stuck to the side here. It's like the wires coming across and it's stuck on the side here. You haven't used the proper battery which is interesting. So I'm going to be replacing that with the proper battery. Obviously I'll be careful not to lose the constants and the calibration because right now it is kind of calibrated. I don't know how accurate it is yet. I haven't actually done that kind of testing on it yet. So I do want to make sure I keep the current calibration in case it is good. If it is good then that's great because you know, it's another reference meter I've got which I can kind of trust. It did have calibration seals still on it in the casing. It had calibration seals on there so I actually broke those seals to get into it. But that doesn't really mean anything because you can do external calibration. You know, the seal doesn't really, there's no seal on the switch on the back, so who knows how accurate they were. Something I've also done as well. This comes with a setting of 115 volts for the AC supply input. On the other side, the bottom edge, you've got this corner here. Bottom corner, there's some jumper links. I've had to swap those around, so link two and three are in place. I've taken one of those links out, swung the other one around, so it's doing a replacement as link one instead, which is the 230 volt setting. So I've got that done already, so now I can actually power this up from my local power supply without having to worry about remembering to set this correctly. It's always a nervous thing for me is you know switching the AC supply and potentially one day I could forget to switch that over and shove 230 volts into a piece of gear and I'm really worried about doing that so one of the first things I always do is change the voltage. So that's been done. So I've done the electrolytics on the power supply now I'm doing the tantalums so the one which I was worried about being a 5 volt rail it is indeed a 6.3 volt tantalum that's a 47 microfarad the closest thing I've got is a 10 volt tantalum, 100 microfarad. That will have to do. It's a bit of an upgrade. Hopefully the big value difference isn't a problem. It might result in more noise, I'm not sure. But I definitely don't want to have something which is only 1 volt above the power supply. That's just so dodgy. At least this is double the supply voltage, so this should last forever. You can also see to do these capacitor replacements, also took the DPIB board out. So here's the ribbon cables that normally run to it. Now let's pop that out of the way, so I can access all the solder joints a bit more easily. Main thing was for the tantalums, because they're a bit hard to get to down here, right down there. So I need to get the flexes out of the way so I can get to the solder joints and actually reach the tantalums properly. I've got two tantalums to replace now. Those are the two on 15 volt rail, which are 25 volt tantalums. Replace both of those, and then I can put all that back together again, and that'll be done. Then I can work on the analog ball around the other side and do all those ones. And that's basically all the caps done then. This shouldn't take me too much longer really. Maybe another half an hour to an hour. little trick with these clips, when you've got these ribbon cables like this and you've got these latches on, if you pull it over sideways, you can actually release it. So you don't have to try and leave it aside out, you can just put it sideways and it pops it off. little trick for that. Over here are these capacitors which I need to replace. These are always bad. I'm not going to measure them. I know they're going to be bad. Or should I measure them just to prove it? I probably should actually. So I'll read them afterwards anyway. Anyway, let's get this board out. So I'll pull these out. Gently rock them 
don't bend the pinch. Don't be trying to replace these things. There's also a power connector over here, pull this out. And there's also another one on this side. Really nice as I've gloved up this time because this is a precision analogue board, so I'm going to keep it that way. And I'm not planning to do much work on this, apart from replacing these capacitors. I don't want to be having to wash the whole board by touching it. So in this case, I'm going to try and keep my fingers off it. So that's those off. Now, what it's got is these little latches. Pull lashes, pull those up. The black ones. Now these will sometimes break, and I do actually have spares of these. I managed to sort some, so that's what I've done. Now I've got to release these pin latches, and I can get the board out. I've got to show you some more over here as well. I must miss that one. So that is now free. So I'll take these ones here off, which are a little bit harder. I'll try and squeeze these latches in whilst lift the board up. Oh, I must forgot as well. There's another one of these latches over here. So it goes to the digital board. Let's pop this off. Must forget the board is out. There we go. Now I can pop it out. So I'm just going to use tweezers. Squeeze that match. Get it pushed in. Once it's got going through the board, and we move on to the next one. There's probably some special tool we can get for this. Right, that's now free. Let's try and lift this out really carefully. Without snagging connectors and all sorts of stuff. There are no signs of rework. It's all original. Yep, all original. Nice. So if you look at these capacitors, all of these little ferrite beads on them. Those little beads. So I've got to make sure that when I replace these, I'll put these beads onto the new capacitors. Alright, so I'll just replace these capacitors, just clean the board up. Get the flux back off it. Don't leave any flux on there, you can see it's coming off quite nicely really. Right, it's just his caps and proved they're bad. So I've got the first one hooked up already. It's a 10 microfarad. Uh, what's that? 63 volt was supposed to be measuring 5.5 microfarad. That is my 100 hertz. 1.5 kilo ohms ESR and dissipation. It's 5.5. She's dead, Jim. Next one. This should be the same value. I kept them in the same order as they came out of the board, so they um, you can relate which one's which. Okay, it's on there. So this is page 1.1. Oh, no, bad connections. Keep going. 7 microfarad, 2 dissipation. Yeah. ESR is sort of at least half an ohm. Sorry, half a K. Very bad. Another dead one. Next, this is a 33 microfarad, 40 volt. 32 microfarad, 26 ohms ESR, getting up there, and uh, 0.5 dissipation. Also a bit of solder on his legs causing problems. Big connections. Let's try again. 32 microfarad, 0.4 dissipation, ESR, 23 ohms. Again, up there a little bit, not too bad. Obviously the first two we did were definitely bad. Next one, these will be, um, what's this one? 47 microfarad, 25 volt. 14 microfarad, 150 ohms ESR, also bad. Dissipation, 1.4. This is why I always replace these particular caps, because they are always bad. I don't know, it's maybe something to do with a part of the circuit or something, I don't know what it is, but... It's a bootstrap circuit for the op amps. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, this one's 13 microfarad, 1.7 dissipation, ESR 0.2. So, yes, all those are bad. Let's check the power supply ones which I pulled out. Just stuff behind here. See what these are like. Last time, these are actually not too bad. 
Um, but I replaced them anyway because they're old. And you don't really want one of these things failing and then taking out the tantalums across the whole unit. So let's see what this one is. Uh, what's that one? That's a uh, 10 microfarad 350 volt. Here we go, 10 microfarad. 8 ohms ESR. Yeah. And dissipation, 0.05. That one's probably still kind of alright. Next one is a 4700 microfarad 16 volt. Zero ohms ESR basically, so that one's actually probably still alright as well. Next one, this is a 10, uh, 1000 microfarad 40 volt. 977 microfarad, zero ohms ESR. Dissipation 0.05, again, still okay. So, you know, like I said, these power supply ones usually aren't too bad. They're a bit more tolerant for some reason. But the small ones on the board are horrendous. And 984.04 dissipation, ESR, it's going to be zero. Yeah, 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 bad connection. ESR is going to be, once it gets a good connection again, zero. All right, so, yeah. So basically, power supply ones I could have really left, but I don't like to leave them. Whilst, you know, these things are 30 years old. They need doing. What's it? 34. This is 1987. So, 34 years old. Time to replace them. So the last problem I think I had to fix on this thing. I've already cleaned all the switches on the front. I don't think they're actually okay. Or not. I've flushed them out and tried to clean them. So I'll see if it actually does the job. We had this socket on the back, which is all broken. All the pins were sticking out like this. Instead of having a housing around it, which is also broken off somehow or something we got that part so I've taken this off obviously it's just two wires on it which are here all right so it's got this orange and black this has actually been all twisted up it's all knotted up inside here it's like it's been twisted and twisted and twisted some of it looks original but some of it looks like it's been someone just turning the thing <laughs> anyway it's all tied up in there but luckily it's okay it doesn't appear to be damaged otherwise so what I've done is I've reamed that hole out a bit bigger because you know, I didn't have anything of the right size. I do have these. Now these are actually four pin microphone sockets for CB radios. You can get these in different configurations. You can get them in two pin and all sorts of stuff, right? Up to, I don't know, any pins, I think it's 10 or 12 or something. I don't know, but anyway. I have a whole bunch of four pin and five pin ones. So what I was thinking I was gonna do is put this in, in place and I use that in its spot. It might not be key to potentially turn it, but I don't, planning on using this anyway so I'm not really too worried to be honest I just wanted something to replace this broken connector and this is a really common type you can get these really easily so it made sense to put it one of those on I mean it's only a trigger it's not basically precise it would be fine okay so I've got it mounted in so it's just a 19 mil spanner to get that nut done up there you have to kind of hold the front end because I haven't got the key obviously because I just did a round hole and not one with a flat surface so it locks it in but that's fine Pin 1 and 2 are the pins I'm going to use. So it goes pin 1, pin 2, pin 3, and pin 4. That's how those are arranged in there. I'm just going to use pin 1 and 2. Pin 1 I'll make as the ground, or the, or the black wire, which I think is going to be a ground or a zero volt rail. I should actually check that. And the orange I'll make to pin 2. So I'm just going to check over here on the GPIB board. Yep, sure enough, the black is indeed a zero volt rail, so that's fine. Something I did as well, just for ease of access, mainly from when I was doing the nut up, is I've taken this little bracket off that goes on there. It sits just in there. I'll just take that off. And it's got these little um, tapered bolts in there. And these actually have washers in between. So the washers are in between this plate and this plate, which goes underneath. It sits under there. And the washers go in between the two. Just to space it off slightly, I think. So there you go. That's that socket replaced. All done. Now it's refitting this bracket here, so you can just see the spacer. A little washer in between the two plates there, you can just see that. So don't forget that because obviously it needs it for spacing or alignment or something, I don't know. Done. I should also point out the anatomy of these things. So this is the GPIB board. This is the display driver board. This is the resistance board. This is the AC board, which you can see is a massive. Now, there's actually two versions of these AC boards. There's a smaller one, which is about half as big, which is less precise. It's got less resolution on it and that sort of stuff. But then next to it here, there would be a 
current board for the ammeter, which does like two amps, I think, something like that. But this particular model doesn't have that, it's just got a higher precision AC board instead. And this side, that is the analog board, which does all the position goodness, converts the various signals from different boards, does the main conversions on this board, and then sends them to the digital board over here, which has got obviously the EPROMs and stuff on it for that. This later version has a crystal in it. Some of the early ones have a trimmer, instead there's a metal can here with an adjustment on it, for tuning the line frequency stuff. This one has a crystal. The initial testing I did showed it being quite stable, it didn't really seem to be very noisy, so I'm guessing maybe I don't need to do anything here, but I'm just going to double check that in the manual. I have done the line conversion as far as the voltage goes, but I need to check on this part, because this is something I'm going to have to adjust as well. Right, let's power this thing up, see if it's going to go bang. I've got power plugged in. I've already got a set. Oh, I just turned it on already. I had to switch on. Oops. Well, it hasn't gone bang. That's looking promising. Well, let's plug this in. I've already turned it on to warm up a little bit, just in case I needed it. It's been on very long now, only a few minutes. Zero volts, do one volt. Yep, get one volt out. Excellent, it's doing something at least. What do I range it? Here we go. So it turns out that the thing we've got to do over here for the frequency adjustment for the line frequency, because it's using a crystal, this is set for 60 hertz line frequency. Obviously here, where I am, my country, it's 50 hertz line frequency. And because it's using a crystal, apparently I have to change the crystal to a different one. Well that's great, isn't it? Now I've got to try and find the right crystal. 10 volts. Obviously it's not warmed up or anything and you know, it's going to be wrong. But I suppose that's fine. Let's push for the button, see if that works. Yes, because when I was getting in trouble before. But I seem to be working better than they were. Still I've been playing up before. So that's good. I've been meter showing 25 watts. So that's looking alright. Should have checked that first actually. It's at least behaving. And yeah, the reading's come down slightly there. It's drifting downwards as it warms up a little bit. So I don't know if the calibration is any good or not, as I said before. So because I have to figure it out. But I've got to change the battery yet. That battery I'm not happy with. I need to change that. Don't like this bodge I've got in there. I've got a proper battery to put in, which is the right size, which will last 10 years or so. So I'm going to put that in. So here we go. I've got the 1082 in my equipment rack here. My, well, not only rack is it, it's a stack. It's stacked up. It's not calibrated yet, but it's in place. I've done a rough calibration, but it needs to be fully warmed up and that sort of stuff. And once it's been warmed up for, I don't know, probably eight hours. I might do it on the weekend or something. Wait for eight hours, then do a calibration between these two units here. And it should be really, really good then. Um, it's looking pretty stable. Now, one thing I don't have done yet is the crystal replacement for the 50 hertz line frequency. It still has a 60 hertz crystal in there, which means in theory, every five seconds, it should be right. I, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it's actually considering it's not the right crystal. It's actually pretty stable. I mean, that's one volt reading. So that's microvolts, nanovolts. Is that picovolts? Will be in it. Hundreds of picovolts. So it's pretty good, really, considering it's got the wrong crystal in there. So I probably won't do that full calibration until I've got that crystal and I've got that installed. So then it's at least eliminating the noise issues and may potentially false readings from that. So I'll probably won't do the full calibration till then. But as you can see, it's basically working fine. It's um, it's good. I'm I'm really happy. I've got that. I mean, the price I paid for it was really good for the units. You know, it's, I paid. Uh, it's about twelve hundred dollars for it, something like New Zealand. Some of the other units, like the one hundred six twos, I've picked up. They've been a lot cheaper. That's because they're only six and a half digits, and they were broken. Whereas this was basically working, so don't have to do much to it. It's a bit of a refurb, and I'll calibrate it once it's all finalised. And but it's good. Thumbs up if you like the video. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Click the bell icon to get notifications about my videos when I release them. And have a chat down below in the comments. Bye.